This is the Louis T. Network. It's me. Who else could it be but Louis T telling you to not watch me, watch TV. But of course, I'm on TV, so watch me. Welcome to the program. It is Thursday here on Pro Football Central Weekly. I'm your host, of course, Louis T. And want to talk about the Thursday night football matchup. Coming up, it's a big one. Somebody's in trouble. Someone's going to be one and three in the NFC West after tonight. It's either going to be the St. Louis Rams, who are losers of two straight after winning their home opener and their season opener versus the Arizona Cardinals, or it's going to be the team on the road who has struggled of late, losers of their last two straight, the first time under Jim Harbaugh as the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers, that being the aforementioned San Francisco 49ers. So, look, this is a huge matchup. A lot of expectations are probably going to go down the drain after this one is over. If you fall to one and three, it's not impossible. It's not out of the realm of possibility. You can come back from one and three. Look, we've got a lot of football to play in this season. After this game for these two teams, they've still got 12 games left on the docket to take care of. So there's a lot of football to be played. However, keep in mind, one and three is a tough hole to dig yourself up out of. Now, it's not impossible. Again, it can be done. But the way the Seattle Seahawks look, And the way the NFC is probably going to shape up, when it's all said and done, you're probably going to need nine, at minimum, maybe even ten wins to get into the postseason. Now, looking around the league, the Bears are 3-0, the Saints are 3-0, the Cowboys are 2-1, the Seahawks are 3-0. So right there, we're talking about four teams playing some pretty good football that look like teams that could be around in January, come playoff time, and of those teams I just named, at least two out of the four, if not three, are going to probably either win their division or win 10-plus games. So right there, you're put in a bind where you need to win nine or ten games to get into the postseason. You start one and three, you've increased your chances of missing the postseason and decreased your chances to get to 10 victories on the season. So it's going to be tough sledding for the loser of this football game. The winner isn't out of the woods yet, but they've increased their chances to make some hay in the NFC and in, probably more importantly, this division, the NFC West, because you don't want to let the Seattle Seahawks run away with this thing too early on in the season. And so this is going to be a huge matchup, one that I expect to be a close ball game. I expect the St. Louis Rams to hang in there with the 49ers. I honestly do not expect the Rams to win this football game. I just don't. I don't trust the Rams. They haven't shown me enough. Jeff Fisher and this group have struggled to start ball games the last two weeks. They struggled against Dallas last week, and they were trounced in that game. They struggled to get out of the gates against the Atlanta Falcons two weeks ago in Atlanta. However, they were able to rebound and make that a ball game. They didn't make it a ball game last week against Dallas, and so they're searching for answers. The, the key to the game for them, start fast. Don't come out of the gates sluggish and allow the 49ers to jump on you early and put you in a hole like you've been the last two weeks. you got to come out of the gates swinging, and you got to come out with a sense of urgency, something that they have lacked the last two weeks of the season. And so I'm looking for the Rams to come out in this game and try to make a statement. This is a team that they had some success against last season, and they need to build upon that. A lot of expectations coming into this season for the Rams. They haven't quite lived up to them thus far, but again, a lot of season left to be played. But if they go to one and three, 
this season does not look to be in the best of shape for the Rams. So this is a huge one at home versus the San Francisco 49ers. You flip that coin over and you take a look at the San Francisco 49ers after starting off with a impressive victory at home versus the Green Bay Packers. This San Francisco 49ers had a huge road test against the Seattle Seahawks. They failed that miserably. But again, what happens in Seattle stays in Seattle. You're willing to forgive them for that performance. A lot of injuries. And it's Seattle. Seattle is the most dominant football team at home. They hold the most clear advantage at home of any team in the National Football League. And they exerted their will on the 49ers at home. No surprise there. Honestly. And so that was fine. That was a separate incident. We were willing to forgive the 49ers and look at that game as a separate entity and slide that over to the side and say, okay, you're back home. Indianapolis Colts take care of business, business as usual. Go out, get the W, and we'll move on. That didn't happen. It wasn't business as usual. In San Francisco, they lose, they're dominated. And it's not just the loss itself. They were dominated. They were manhandled at home against a team that isn't known for smash mouth football in the Indianapolis Colts, or at least they weren't known for that. I think Chuck Pagano is changing the identity of that football team very slowly. But they went in and they did to the 49ers what the 49ers are used to doing to other teams. They were physical. They were fast. They were hungry, and they ran the football, smash mouth football. And 49ers did not step up to that challenge, and they were throttled at home 27-7. And so you look at this 49ers team coming into this game, two straight losses, something that we're not accustomed to saying with this 49ers team since Jim Harbaugh took over. He was 7-0 and coming into that game after a loss. Now he's 7-1. and And so now you're looking to see if the 49ers can rebound on the road against a team that gave them some fits last year. And so interesting to see if the 49ers show up. I expect them to. I expect them to go into St. Louis win this football game. I don't expect it to be a blowout, though. I expect them to have to work hard for this. I expect the Rams to give them everything they've got. I just don't think it's going to be enough because the St. Louis Rams are not a better football team than the San Francisco 49ers. Now, 49ers have some injuries. They have a lot of guys who are question marks going into this football game, don't know if they're going to play or not. You know, Vernon Davis, huge part of this offense. Can't stress that enough. I've said this on numerous occasions. This team doesn't look the same on offense when Vernon Davis isn't in the lineup. He needs to play, even if he's 85%. If he can just go out there and be a decoy, he will help this offense tremendously. When he left the football game against the Seahawks two weeks ago, that game changed. He didn't play last week, and this offense was stale last week. So if he can go... That's going to give this offense a huge boost that they did not have a week ago. You look at Anthony Davis, an integral part of this offense on the offensive line. He's questionable. You look at Patrick Willis. He probably won't be able to go with that groin. And so they've got some question marks. Nominee Asamoa might not be able to go in this game as well. So 49 is a little banged up. We already know about all the injuries they have at the receiver position. And so this is a huge game, and they need to be able to get it done offensively, something that they did not do a week ago. It'll be interesting to see how this game unfolds, but ultimately – When it's all said and done, I believe the San Francisco 49ers will get it done on the road against the St. Louis Rams. I do not expect this to be a blowout, though. I do not expect the St. Louis Rams to just lay down for the San Francisco 49ers. I expect them to make the 49ers work for this game. And if the 49ers struggle like they did a week ago, the Rams can take this game. But I don't see it happening. I think the 49ers are going to get this one on Thursday Night Football. Should be a lot of fun. Can't wait to watch that football game. So, That was the appetizer, okay? Now it's time for the main course. And I got to dive headfirst into this Josh Freeman situation. We didn't have this on Tuesday. This was some news that came about Wednesday, and so I'm here to dive into this thing. Last week, Thursday, we had some news that came our way. It was a trade involving Trent Richardson off to Indianapolis in exchange for a first-round pick to the Browns. Now we have a situation where another trade could be on the horizon. And so a lot of activity in the National Football League during the season, something that does not happen that often. But you look at this Josh Freeman situation, and I've talked about this several times, but I've never really 
dove in to this situation the way I'm about to now. And look, he's been benched. Greg Schiano, head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, feels like, and he was never a supporter. Let me first get that out of the way. He was never a supporter of Josh Freeman. He would give him half-hearted votes of confidence and he would say to people in the offseason hey josh freeman is our quarterback but there was always a but but josh freeman is the quarterback but there is a healthy competition between the other quarterbacks that we have in camp mainly the rookie mike glennon out of nc state he was a guy that was drafted by greg Schiano. greg Schiano knows very well from his college days at rutgers and so you knew that Josh Freeman was on a short lease, especially the way they ended the season last year. A couple of four interception games, one against New Orleans, one against the Rams. Those games really turned Greg Schiano off, especially when the Buccaneers were playing some solid football, had a chance. Those games, they did not win. They did not stand a chance in those games because Josh Freeman turned the football over so many times. Greg Schiano really didn't have the patience for that. And, he was never, again, not a Josh Freeman uh, supporter, not a Josh Freeman guy because he didn't draft him. He inherited. That's the key word here. He inherited Josh Freeman. He did not select him. And when you're a head coach and you're coming into a situation, you want your guys, you want your stuff in running your system. And so if you don't have those guys available to you when you first get there, you got to take what's available to you. And Josh Freeman was available to Greg Schiano when he inherited this team. Now that he's already here and he's ready to put his stamp on his football team, he, he doesn't see Josh Freeman being the guy to lead this Tampa Bay Buccaneers team into the future. And so I feel like they set Josh Freeman up for failure. If you watch this team closely this year, and look, no one wants to lose. Let, let me say that first and foremost. It's not like Greg Schiano wanted this Buccaneers team to start the season 0-3. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is he and the offensive coordinator in Tampa Bay, they did a horrendous job of putting the Buccaneers in positions to succeed offensively in the 20 in this season thus far. You look at that Jets game, and you could also couple in that performance versus the New Orleans Saints when the Buccaneers failed to score 20 points in both of those matchups. They ran the ball on first down. They ran the ball on second down. When it wasn't effective, it put them in third and long, and then they asked Josh Freeman to bail them out on third and long. That's not fair to him. That's not fair to him at all. And it seemed like in the first couple of games of the season, they ran the football a lot, more so than you would have liked to have seen them do. And then they put the onus on Josh Freeman on third down when teams know you're passing, when they get to bend their ears back and come after the quarterback, when they get to play exotic coverages because they know you have to throw the football to pick up a first down. And now what is Josh Freeman to do? And you look at the Patriots game, conversely, it was the direct opposite. They said, okay, he's looked bad in the first two games because we've kept him under wraps. Now we're going to turn him loose. We're going to give him every opportunity to fire the football around the field and see what he can do. And if he doesn't get it done, that'll give us the ammunition we need to say that he's not getting it done and that we can bench him and move on with Mike Glennon. They gave him the keys, and they said, hey, go wherever you want. The car is full of gas. Drive wherever you like. Just make sure you bring the car back when you're finished. And they gave him the keys, and he took off, and he was firing the football all around the field. Guys did not help him out. There were a couple of drops in that game. He didn't make the best decisions all the time. He threw a pick right before the half that I thought kind of sealed his fate in that game. But all in all, they didn't convert on fourth and one, which is a down that you saw, which is a down that you are supposed to be able to pick up with a back like Doug Martin on your football team. When you've got Doug E. Flash, you're supposed to be able to pick up fourth and one. You went out and got Carl Nix. And you spent money on this offensive line to be able to pick up fourth and one. And to not pick it up was inexcusable. And so he wasn't helped out in this game versus the Patriots, a game in which they only scored three points. And so that was it. That was the last straw for Greg Schiano. He had seen enough. It was time for him to make a change. And I had said some changes were needed in Tampa Bay, but I did not foresee this one happening so soon. This was a quick hook 
in Tampa Bay. I did not expect Greg Schiano to pull the plug on the Josh Freeman experiment this soon. I felt like there was a lot of football left to be played in this season. And, of course, the Bucs are 0-3, and so it's getting late early. But still, I thought there was more time for Josh Freeman to be able to show what he can do. But I, I get it, I guess. At the same time, Josh Freeman has been in the league. He's going into his fourth season. He's had time to prove what he can be in this league. And I think, honestly speaking, that it's time for Josh Freeman to move on. I think that this situation in Tampa Bay is unhealthy for him. I think he's a guy that can be a successful quarterback in this league if he's put in the right situation. I just think he needs a fresh start. Sometimes guys just need a fresh start to be able to exhale, take a breath, reflect on what they've done to this point and realize the mistakes that they've made, grow as a player and get better. And maybe a change in scenery is what Josh Freeman needs to do all of those things and move forward with his career. So, I saw that ESPN had an exclusive with Josh Freeman, and I actually got a sneak peek at it. And they're going to show the whole interview on Sunday, on the Sunday Countdown show. And so I, I probably won't see the whole interview, but the snippet that I did get to see that I caught, he was emotional. He wasn't crying, but you could see it hurts that he's not the starting quarterback in Tampa Bay. He understands the nature of the business, but he doesn't feel like he was given a fair shot. And he was asked directly, did he want to be traded? And he said, yeah, I, I do want to be traded because the writing's on the wall here in Tampa Bay. My time is up. They don't want me here and they don't see me in their future. And so I don't need to remain here. I I'm ready to start the next chapter of my career. And so he's ready to start that right now. Not at the end of the season when he becomes a free agent. He's ready to start that now. And so now it's up to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to find a suitable trade partner to get rid of Josh Freeman. And so now the question I pose to you all is who is the best option for the Buccaneers to trade Josh Freeman to? Where does it make the most sense for Josh Freeman to be shipped? And there's not a lot of opportunities for him to find a home, especially during the season, because there's so much football left to be played. You don't know which quarterback situations are going to be a mess at the end of the season. Right now, we're only going into week four. But there are some situations that are a little unstable. I talked about them. It's funny that we're having this conversation now because I talked about some unstable quarterbacking situations. And this Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterbacking situation was one of those unstable quarterbacking situations. So it's not ironic that we're talking about Josh Freeman being benched and that this quarterbacking situation has been shuffled around a little bit. But now it is ironic that we're talking about him moving on and potentially those other teams that we talked about that have unstable quarterbacking situations could be landing destinations potentially for Josh Freeman. So to me, you look at about three destinations right now. And I don't know if any of these teams are desperate enough to come calling, to pick up the phone and dial up the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and see what they're looking for in exchange for Josh Freeman. But of course, those teams are Minnesota, Cleveland, and Jacksonville. And so you look at those teams and you got to feel like of those three teams, the most logical fit for Josh Freeman would be Cleveland because of the amount of talent that they already have on that football team. But if you're the Cleveland Browns, you want your own quarterback. You want to be able to call a guy your own. You don't want to go and get somebody else's retread. You want to say, hey, we're going into the draft next year and we're drafting us a quarterback of the future. Now, that's not to say that you can't acquire Josh Freeman and still draft that guy and not play him right away. But the way the NFL is set up now and the way it's structured, you draft a quarterback in the first round, nine times out of ten, you want that guy to be able to play right away. The days of Aaron Rodgers sitting on the bench for three years behind a Hall of Fame quarterback or a guy being drafted and sitting down for a year or two like Matt Lyon or like Carson Palmer did in his first season, those days are over. You're not going to see a lot of quarterbacks sit out a whole entire season. 
maybe part of the season, maybe a partial like Jake Locker did in Tennessee with Matt Hasselback, but not a whole season. And so if Josh Freeman goes to Cleveland, he's going to want to start in Cleveland long term. He's not looking to be a stopgap for anyone. He wants to start and start and be the long term solution wherever he goes. I don't think that's the option that he will be given in Cleveland. So I'm taking Cleveland off the list. So you look at Minnesota and I look at the Minnesota Vikings and they're still trying to figure out who Christian Ponder is. Really, who are you? And no one really knows. I think I know. You think you know, but we're not sure yet. And so the jury's still out on Christian Ponder. He's banged up right now. He's not going to start on uh, Sunday versus the Pittsburgh Steelers in London. That honor will go to Matt Castle. And he's not any good either. And so there's some question marks at the quarterback position in Minnesota. Enough so that you could ask the question, does Josh Freeman make sense in Minnesota? I think that's a plausible question to ask. But you're still trying to figure out who Christian Ponder is. The last thing you need to do is trade for Josh Freeman and have someone breathing down his neck, looking over his shoulder. I think he already has enough of that with Matt Castle being his backup. I don't think he needs any more of that with Josh Freeman. But with the targets that they have, I think Josh Freeman would be an ideal candidate to come in and play football there as well. But with the situation the way it is in Minnesota, I think you can go ahead and cross them off the list as well. So that leaves us in probably the most ideal situation for Josh Freeman and I don't agree with this in terms of a good fit because I don't like the talent base in Jacksonville but if you're looking to start if you're looking to be the quarterback of the future if you're looking to go somewhere and feel like they want you Jacksonville could be that place it's not that far from Tampa you're still in the state of Florida and this team right now I don't really know if they have a direction. Those other two teams that I mentioned think they have a direction. Right now it's a little muddled and a little cloudy, maybe more so in Minnesota than it is Cleveland because I think Cleveland has a plan. The, when they traded Trent Richardson, I think they already had a plan in place that they're looking to execute. Minnesota, on the other hand, they're still trying to find their way in 2013. They have a plan in Minnesota. It's called Plan Adrian Peterson. And so that plan can't be executed the way that they want to because they don't have the quarterback there to take the pressure off of Adrian Peterson and that rushing attack in Minnesota. So there are some questions in Minnesota, enough so that you could ask, does Josh Freeman help you enough in this season to go out and get him? But I think ultimately where it's at, if you are a team looking to acquire Josh Freeman, is in Jacksonville. I think Jacksonville is the most logical spot in terms of a team and the necessity. They don't have a plan in Jacksonville. There is no plan in place. There is no structure. There is no foundation. There is no base in Jacksonville. They're running in place right now. And so – if quarterback is something that you can scratch off the list, then by all means, you should do it because it, Blaine Gabbert isn't the answer. Chad Henney, not the answer in Jacksonville. This is for sure. Now, the Jacksonville Jaguars haven't seemed to figure that out yet, and so they're like the guy in the back of the classroom. Everyone else is done with the test. He's still chipping away at it hard, head down, pencil moving, you got to send him to another classroom. We can't stop the class because everybody else is done and he's not. They're slow to figure this thing out, that Blaine Gabbert isn't the answer at the quarterback position. They're lagging behind everyone else. Everyone else has already figured out Blaine Gabbert isn't the man for the job in Jacksonville. But they're still trying to evaluate him. So let them take their time, which is why they're the Jacksonville Jaguars, which is why they have to give away free beers to get people to come to their home games because they're not getting it done and they're not smart as an organization. Maybe they can be smart this time. Make the move. Pick up the phone. Call the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Offer them a fourth-round selection. Throw in a player if you like. Get Josh Freeman into Jacksonville. Get him acclimated to this system, catch him up to speed, 
and figure out if he's the guy in Jacksonville for years to come so that you don't have to spend a first-round pick on a quarterback and you can divulge that pick to something else that you need because you need a lot of stuff in Jacksonville. And if you can scratch quarterback off that list, by all means, do so if you are the Jacksonville Jaguars. And so I don't like the fit for Josh Freeman in terms of talent because there's not a huge talent base in Jacksonville. There are other destinations that would suit Josh Freeman's talents a lot better, more so than Jacksonville, especially in Cleveland. I think that's probably the best fit for him because they're ready-made right now in Cleveland. They just need a quarterback. If they get a quarterback – that can fling the football around, not turn it over, and play some really solid football in Cleveland, they could be a team that could surprise people right now in 2013. But with Jacksonville, they've got a lot of building to do. But this would be one piece of the puzzle that you currently don't have that you can look at yourself and say, hey, we've got one part of the puzzle solved. Now let's go out and see if we can find some other pieces to collect to put this thing together. So Jacksonville, for me, I don't know about you. What do you think? What's the best landing destination for Josh Freeman? For me, I think that place is Jacksonville. Now, ideally, it'd be Cleveland. But the one that makes the most sense to me during the season would be Jacksonville. What do you think? And so now that you've had the main course, You've had the appetizer. I know you've got a little bit of space left. It's time for that mental snack. And that mental snack for today is simply, Ray Lewis, sit down and shut up. What are you doing? What the hell are you doing? What are you talking about, Ray? What are you talking about? The Ravens brought you back to... M&T Bank, they put your number up in the rafters, you're in the ring of fame, they gave you a ceremony, it was beautiful, everyone got emotional, you had your Super Bowl ring, you got to go out on top, you went out on your own terms, don't be an angry old ex-player, please spare me, miss me with the angry, disgruntled player because you don't get to play that card. You don't get to be Brian Erlacher. He's got a reason to be mad. He didn't get to leave on his own terms. He didn't get to ride out on his black stallion like you did. He didn't get to go out a champion. He got pushed out of the door, and they told him, here, take your bags, get out of here. So he gets to be angry. He gets to play the angry ex-player role. He gets to pull that card and lay it on the table. Now, I'm getting annoyed with Brian Urlacher as well, but at least he has some leeway. He has some rope. I'll allow him to hang himself. You, on the other hand, you don't get to play that card at all. You got everything to go the way you want it to on the way out the door. You got the Super Bowl ring. You got to leave under your own terms. Everything was beautiful. Shut up. So when you come back and you're talking about, oh, the Ravens lack leadership. Really? The Ravens lack leadership? Really, Ray? They lack leadership. Why? Because you're not there now? So all of a sudden, because you leave the locker room and Ed's no longer there, they don't have any leadership in that locker room. Really? Stop it, Ray. Stop it. (laughs) Stop it, Ray. That is asinine. So Terrell Suggs isn't a veteran leader in that locker room. Daryl Smith hasn't come in and fit right into the role that you had last year. He's not the emotional leader. He's not going to get in everybody's face and, what's up, is it? He's not going to do all of that stuff. But he's a veteran like you were on this football team at the linebacker position that knows how to get it done. He's a voice in that locker room that everyone can listen to, that everyone can turn to for guidance. Don't talk about there's no leadership in that locker room. Stop it, okay? You're looking for attention. You work at ESPN. Go sit at your little desk at ESPN, talk about games in the National Football League, leave the Ravens alone. They've done enough. They've given you everything you could ask for, and then some. Don't start that nonsense, Ray, okay? Cut it out. So, with that being said, shameless plug time. Visit the site, profootballcentral.com. All your football needs are on this site. It's your one-stop shop for everything National Football League related. There's print articles. There's podcasts. Over 20 for your liking, for your listening pleasure. Check out the site 
ProFootballCentral.com. For me and all of the ProFootballCentral.com staff, I thank you for joining me here on Pro Football Central Weekly, the Thursday edition in week four. Have a good one. And remember, we are Pro Football Central. See you next time on Tuesday when I come back and we're talking about week four action here on this program. See you next time.